in case you are wondering where I'm going to be next Tuesday, I'm giving this talk, Exploring New Stabilization Technologies and Enhancing Last Mile Supply Chain Logistics. You can ask Diana all about it. She knows all the details. So I will not be here for the exam. We have a proctor for that. Um, I will, however, be checking my email. So if any questions come up, um, ask the proctor and they will email me and I will do my best to answer whatever those questions are. But now, are there any questions about the exam? Not yet. As usual, 50 multiple choice questions. The exam starts at 8. You should have more than enough time to finish it by the 10 o'clock ending time. That's the normal ending time for this class section time. And again, um, ask the proctor and they will email me. That's why we have this computer here at the beginning. As usual with reviews, I'm going to go through far too much material far too quickly. Slow me down when you would like any more clarification, and I will do my best to provide any of that. Going back and looking at where we started, seems like a ridiculous time period ago and lots of information. Uh, started with the DNA viruses and then sort of moved into some of the weird viruses and the retroviruses kind of at the end. So the small double-stranded DNA viruses that are infecting eukaryotes, the polyoma and the papilloma viruses, a couple of important aspects as far as I'm concerned about these viruses. First one is that SV40 and all of the papilloma viruses have these really weird structures where they have pentamers where hexamers should be, um, but they still have single jelly roll and fit together to make nice icosahedral particles, just way more flexible than anybody thought they could be. The genomes of the polyomaviruses, and this is different from the papillomaviruses, actually look a lot like things like bacteriophage lambda. They've got this region here, intergenic region, which is regulating promoters that go off in opposite directions. There are viral proteins that are involved in regulating the transcription of each of these, you know, left and right. We've got a whole set of structural genes over here, non-structural genes over here. A couple of differences, however, relative to lambda. One is that these guys don't integrate. And the second one is that you're getting different genes through differential splicing. And splicing happens extremely rarely in bacterial cells. So those are a couple of the differences relative to lambda. The other big take-home message here, and pun not intended, is the large T antigen, which is, as I love to call it, the Swiss army knife of pretty much any viral protein more or less does everything. Um, it's involved in regulating the cell cycle because all of these double-stranded DNA viruses are dependent on various amounts of cellular processes, particularly the small ones, the polyomas and the papillomas, have to stimulate the cell cycle in order to be able to replicate. So cell cycle stimulation happens through interactions with RB. Um, this Protein has to be in the nucleus to be able to do that. Again, most of the time these cells are not actively replicating, so you need to stimulate the progression through the cell cycle. The other T antigens do this as well, but large T antigen is the big one. Interactions both with RB and P53 as far as the cell cycle is concerned, but it's not just about the cell cycle with a large T antigen. It's also involved in regulating transcription. As I mentioned, that's that viral transcription regulator that binds between the intergenic promoters and both stimulates transcription in one direction and represses transcription going in the other direction. And part of that is through this P300 protein. P300 is a histone acetyltransferase. And that's a reminder that the genome of all of these viruses is packaged in histones, um, normal chromosomal packaging with nucleosomes. So <clears throat> then, oh, pardon, the other thing that the large T antigen does, and I didn't, uh, sorry, I'm going to click through all of these now. 
that I didn't emphasize is that it's also involved in replication, you know, binding to DNA, helicase activity, interactions with the DNA polymerase. So large T antigen, regulation of cell cycle, regulation of transcription, regulation of replication. Again, this is why I kind of call it that Swiss Army knife of viral replication. So that's the polyomaviruses. The papillomaviruses kind of take those activities of the large T antigen and split them into a bunch of different proteins. But otherwise, they still have to do very, very similar things. This genome, and this is something which is confusing for people, is also circular and it is also packaged in nucleosomal templates. It's just drawn here linearly because I guess the author of this chapter didn't want to draw it as a circle. <laughs> um, and the promoters are not divergent like you have in the polyomaviruses. They overlap with each other. <clears throat> so early promoter makes particularly E6 and E7, but also some of these other proteins, E6 and E7, as we'll just see in a second. These are the ones which are involved in regulating the cell cycle. E1 and E2 are really mostly involved in replication and to some extent transcription. And then the late genes, as typical with late genes, are the structural proteins, structural protein genes, I should say. Uh, LCR here is just more abbreviations to the long control region. This is the equivalent of that endogenic region. That's where all of the cellular transcriptional regulatory proteins are going to bind to give you your early promoter-driven transcripts. And then later is also where you're going to have the binding of the viral regulators of transcription. So I mentioned that these are the proteins. Again, they're kind of splitting up the activity of the T antigens um, in polyomaviruses. E1 and E2 are really most important for the replicative parts of replication of the virus. And E6 and E7 are really important for regulation of the cell cycle. Um, large T antigen interacts with both RB and P53. Here, E7 is basically interacting with RB and stimulating the cell cycle, but it also turns on P53. And so you need E6 to turn off P53. So you need the combination of the two. And it's really those two proteins are what leads to the papillomaviruses causing cancer. And so the HeLa cells, which, again, wonderful biotechnological breakthrough, questionable ethics. Um, and then also the reason that I have vaccinated both of my girls um, against, and if I had boys as well, they would also be vaccinated with the Gardasil, the <clears throat> human papilloma vaccine, and just I got to this at the very end of that lecture, I just wanted to emphasize this again. These are, you cannot get human papillomavirus from this vaccine because it doesn't have any of those other proteins at all. It's just the L1 protein, which is what's making the outside shell of the virion. And so you're getting a nice immune response to that outside shell. The L1 protein is different between lots of different HPVs. And so that's why it's Gardasil 9. It's because it's got an L1 protein from HPV 6, from 11, 16, and 18, which are the two that cause the vast majority of cancers. Um, 30, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. These also cause cancers, but in much lower amounts. Um, 16 and 18 are the real, the two biggies as far as forming cervical cancer. So papillomavirus questions. Going once, going twice. Adenovirus, so bigger but still same kinds of issues in terms of regulating the cell cycle. Adenoviruses infect cells that are not usually replicating, so have to have ways of turning on the cell cycle. Also, adenoviruses have these, I don't know, prototypical virion structure, the icosahedra with projections at the five-fold axis of symmetry. These are your pentons, the hexons. And one of the things that I wanted to mention as far as the hexons, which 
These are in fact trimeric proteins that fit into hexons, so what the heck. Um, so basically what you have here is what Jared talked about in the virus, sorry, in the lecture we talked about the virophage. This, these are pseudohexamers. You know, they're trimers, but pseudohexamers. So he talked about pseudohexamers in terms of the structures that you have in these hexameric units putting together the virophage, but also true for all these other ones, for STIV, for um, PRD, no, PRD1, and for PBCV1. All of these have these pseudohexamers. It's a trimeric protein. If you like, you can think of this as just being beta barrels. So this trimer has two beta barrels. So you actually have six beta barrels, and that's what's putting together that hexameric structure. So I want to just emphasize that to make sure that people want to pseudohexamer. What does he mean by pseudohexamer? So that's what's meant by pseudohexamer. The genomes here are not packaged like you have with the polyome and the papillomaviruses. It's not nucleosome bound. These are very different genomes. They're linear, double-stranded genomes with proteins covalently bound at the end, which kind of is an immediate smoking gun. Okay, that's a protein covalently bound at the end of your genome. It's probably serving as a primer. So the primer for replication of these DNA genomes is a protein. This deals with the whole problem of linear genomes. How do you replicate out to the end if DNA polymerases can't start without primers? Use a protein primer. The polyoma papilloma virus, of course, deal with this by the fact they have circular genomes, so they don't have ends that they need to deal with. Um, and then, as we'll see for the pox viruses later on, they have hairpin ends, which is another way of dealing with the same issue. The other thing here is that these genomes have inverted terminal repeats. So that means that the sequence on this strand here, 5 prime to 3 prime at one end of the genome, is identical to the sequence 5 prime to 3 prime on the other strand at the other end of the genome. And this means that they can you know, base pair with each other, which turns out to be really important for replication purposes as well. And yeah, typo in the textbook. Um, what's made from these genomes? Uh, these are. You know, again, looks really complicated. Mostly it's because there's lots and lots of splicing that goes on in the transcripts that are made from the adenovirus genome. And in fact, this is where splicing was found in the first place, was in studying the major late transcripts and seeing that the final RNA didn't match the original RNA or the genome that it started with in the first place. But <clears throat> if you look at the proteins that are made through these transcripts, they're actually really similar to what you see in terms of transcripts and particularly the proteins that are made in the polyoma and the papilloma viruses as well. So you need to regulate the cell cycle. What are you regulating in the cell cycle? Use E1A and E1B to regulate the cell cycle through RB and P53. So again, very analogous to E6 and E7. These then are followed by proteins that are important for replication. So a lot of the, so the terminal protein, for instance, the one that's serving as the primer for the viral DNA polymerase. These are then made next. Again, a lot like E1 and E2 in the papillomaviruses. Um, and then you have your late proteins, and these are all of the late proteins um, being made by this tripartite leader and then differentially not only spliced but also tailed for each of these individual proteins that make up that really complicated, um, certainly in terms of the number of proteins, um, icosahedrally symmetric shell. So it's not a quasi-equivalent structure. It's definitely pseudo because there are many, many different proteins that fit together into the actual virion itself in terms of structural proteins. They also make small RNAs, and this was the first example of some small RNAs that are important for regulatory purposes, and in this case, probably shutting down the innate immune system, which would normally be getting, oh, wait, no, this is, me. this is a virus infection. I need to turn down um, lots of other things. I like this image in particular. It's basically true for the polyomas, the papillomas, and these adenoviruses, really about the 
RB protein normally in the cell cycle. The RB protein gets phosphorylated by cyclin-dependent kinases, and that causes RP, sorry, RB to be released from the cellular E2Fs. Cellular E2Fs, of course, were found because they stimulated expression of the E2 genes in adenovirus, because that's what people were studying at the time. Um, but <clears throat> normally, this is going to be regulating S phase. If you have an adenovirus infection, E1A basically mimics the CDKs as if the cell is going through the cell cycle, sequesters RB, and you have expression of now the E2 genes as well as the S phase genes. So the virus needs both of these. It needs to be expressing its own replicative proteins, but also the proteins that are required for the cell cycle as far as moving through that whole process. Um, these guys are a little different, of course, than those simpler, at least smaller genomes that you have with the polyome and the papillomaviruses, which have these you know, double-stranded nucleosome bounds, so everything is cellular. Here, they're viral. Again, you've got your terminal protein, which is what serves as a primer for the DNA polymerase. And again, this is a viral DNA polymerase, a viral single-stranded DNA binding protein. It's the binding of that single-stranded DNA binding protein. And there's a little bit of helicase activity from the polymerase as well, which will displace the first strand. You end up with one strand here. This strand that's been displaced because of these inverted terminal repeats at either end can bind to itself and then serve as a template for the viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerase being primed by the terminal protein. Questions on adenos? OK, now um, talk about pox viruses. And you can't talk about pox viruses without pox virus disease and vaccines. One guess which one of these two is vaccinated. Good. Um, Anti-vax, unfortunately, is not a new thing. Uh, Jenner developed his vaccine in the late 1700s. In the early 1800s, it was already the, um, and I focus in on this, it's hard to read, but if you look at the slide, you can see a you know, publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. So there was already an Anti-Vaccine Society, and we're over 1,000 measles cases um, this year in the US, which is <sighs> trying to come up with a nice adjective that is suitable for YouTube. Um, <laughs> sad um, is one way of putting it. Um, I particularly like this image um, just to give a bit of an idea, again, of differences between uh, pre-vaccine and post-vaccine. This is a few years old, you know, 2011 now. Um, this measles here in 2011 was at 61, and now we're at 1,000. That's just crazy, but okay, be that as it may. Why have we gotten rid of smallpox? Um, two reasons big reasons anyway. The first one is that humans are the only ones that get smallpox. So there's no reservoir species for smallpox. The second one is, of course, you know, the vaccination and that that vaccine is incredibly stable. And that's what I'll be talking about next Tuesday um, in San Diego is so how you can stabilize vaccines other than um, those that are really stable just by themselves like vaccinia. Uh, the genome of vaccinia and the genome of the variola major is also extremely similar to this, but people haven't done that many experiments with it for hopefully pretty obvious reasons. These also have inverted terminal repeat sequences, only now they don't have a protein bound at one end of the genome. They have this contiguous 5' prime to 3' prime phosphodiester bond. So this is really one big, and when I say big, it's you know, almost 200,000 base pairs, just one piece of DNA that's covalently linked um, the whole way around. So these hairpin structures at the ends of the genome, um, they're not quite as extensive as the ones that George talked about when he talked about the adeno-associated virus or the parvoviruses, but still probably a very similar process. Um, form these structures. They're not completely base paired with each other. Um, and probably some of these incompletely base-paired things here are really important for 
getting the polymerases, the DNA polymerase, to bind to and actually cut this specific sequence in the DNA. And that's what's going to provide your primer in terms of DNA primed DNA replication for these genomes. And we'll take another look at that in just a second here. Pox viruses are members of, we now know, the nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Um, was, it, was it NCLDVs? Again, ridiculous acronym. But these are those viruses that can replicate completely in the cytoplasm. Some of them go to the nucleus, but pox viruses are a really nice example of those that can replicate completely in the cytoplasm. And what that means is these virions bring all of the proteins with them that they need to undergo the first rounds of replication and transcription just by themselves. So they're packaged in the virion. And this is similar to what we talked about that last midterm that we've all forgotten about by now, those negative strand RNA viruses that also have to bring an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase with them because that RNA can't do anything until it's been made into messenger RNA. So here, even more extreme, the double-stranded DNA is not going to get translated. So it's got to have its own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which can then make the RNAs, which can then get translated. And that is all happening here in the cytoplasm. And it's really all about the regulation of transcription. Um, these early messenger RNAs, which will lead to production of intermediate regulatory proteins, leading to the production of the late regulatory proteins, which then end up getting packaged into virions and going back and doing this whole cycle again. DNA replication, the DNA replication only takes place after you have the transcription that takes place because you don't need any more DNA. You've already got that first version of DNA, which has come inside the cell. And then the assembly process and also replication takes place in these separate compartments inside the cell. And these are those viral factories that we talked about again when we talked about the giant viruses. So a separate region inside the cell where you have DNA replication going on, you have lots of translation, you have assembly of virions, all of that happening in one separate place in the cell. And you can see this really easily if you use nucleic acid binding stains. And so in a normal cell, if you use stain for DNA, you'll just see a nucleus. In one of these pox virus infected cells, you'll see nucleus fluorescing, but you'll also see the virus factory fluorescing where you have this production. So it's really particularly early on in this process about transcription. The virus, again, is getting into the cytoplasm, so it has its own RNA dependent, say DNA dependent RNA polymerase, which also requires general transcription factors. And those general transcription factors are also viral proteins. Um, and they basically serve a lot like the TF2 XYZ, actually you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, um, proteins that you have in eukaryotic transcriptional regulation. They also have their own capping and polyatailing enzymes. Again, this is because everything's happening in the cytoplasm. There is no access to the nucleus by any of these um, in these pox viruses. Replication happens, again, as I mentioned, these hairpin ends, they're nowhere near as big, these bulges here. There's a nick that happens in one of the strands, probably again due to binding of these specific sequences, but also structures that you have at the end of the genome. Then a viral helicase will separate out this one end. This now has a primer for the viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which will replicate its way out to the end, runs out of template, more helicase activity, which will pull these two strands apart. They're complementary to each other as well. That will provide a new three prime end, this three prime end right here. That will then get extended, again, from five prime to three prime, all the way down through the rest of the genome. You end up with multiple copies of the genome all hooked up next to each other, so concatomeric structures, not unlike what you see with rolling circle replication that we talked about already for bacteriophage right at the very beginning. And then those pieces need to be cut into separate pieces. And this is the 
a probably something similar to holiday junction resolvases. There are holiday junction resolvase like proteins encoded in pox viruses. So this is probably how that happens. And you know, this is very similar to what happens in these parvoviruses that we'll talk about um, a little bit later on. This is something we got to again at the very end of the pox virus lecture that I wanted to emphasize once more. Pox viruses have these two forms of envelope virions that you can see if you look at infected cells and what they're producing. You have some that have one membrane around them and some that have two membranes, particularly the ones that have two membranes have proteins in that outer membrane, which can cause actin polymerization to take place. And so actin polymerization serves to push out the virions, which are these little red dots here, um, stained with a fluorescent dye that represents virions, with these actin filaments behind them stained in green. And that seems to push the virions from one cell to the next cell. Here's an electron micrograph with one of those actin filaments and one of these extracellular enveloped virus. Again, it's got that extra layer on the outside, allowing this to spread from cell to cell. The other ones, which only have one membrane around the outside, these are the ones which are the really stable ones, and that's probably from person to person, you know, organism to organism transfer, because these are very stable. And again, this is what is used as the vaccine um, for that process. Questions on pox viruses? Yeah. Um, I just wasn't fully clear on the virion picture of it entering that um, cell. Mm -hmm. Is the first thing that kicks it off that there's actually an early mRNA in the virion, or it's just the, um, the DNA uh, polymerase that's already ready to, or the RNA, the DNA dependent RNA polymerase is already ready to go? Yeah, so it, it's, they, as far as I know, I don't think there's any RNAs actually packaged in there. So it's just the DNA plus protein, which comes in. And so it's that protein, which is, you're exactly right, is the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, together with the regulatory proteins, which can allow that to bind to the viral DNA and then start to transcribe at that particular place. Other pox virus questions? OK, so from really large DNA viruses to the really small DNA viruses. This was George's lecture. Um, I'm not quite sure why we had permissive versus non-permissive here in the course. We probably should have had this way earlier on because this is a really you know, big picture process. But at least for the parvoviruses, you've got um, a nice descriptions on how, for instance, you know, canine parvoviruses and the feline parvoviruses that have different permissivities and susceptibilities. So susceptible, you have the receptor on the outside of a cell. So receptor, that virion can get inside. It can release its genome on the inside of the cell. If that cell has the right replicative machinery, then it's permissive. But not all susceptible cells are permissive, and not all permissive cells are susceptible. Makes sense. You have to be susceptible and permissive to get virus replication taking place. Yeah, Melissa. Um, why is it permissive If they couldn't replicate, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, you know, we're going to hand wave here because it's evolution and this is what we see. <laughs> uh, but probably it's a numbers game. And if you just think about the very large numbers of virions, which are going to be in a system, then as long as there are some susceptible and permissive cells, those will be found. Um, that's, you know, viruses don't have any means of locomotion. So um, there just has to be a numbers game. And it seems to be that evolutionarily, there are you know, viruses that will bind to and enter lots and lots of different cells. And some of them will be permissive, and some of them won't. So again, it does seem like a bit of a strange process. But probably, again, it's one of these things where you've selected for really huge numbers of virus particles. And you know, so your replication, you end up with lots and lots of PFUs. And a bunch of them will be lost. But it doesn't matter. You just need one. 
you know, very, very specific kinds of interactions. Yeah. Well, yeah again, the <laughs> multiple ways to skin the cat. There's lots of ways to replicate. So um, that just seems to be the process. Yeah. And there are, so you know, that's why we describe them as such. And we have to give them names, and so you know, susceptible or permissive is what we come up with. Yeah. The virus doesn't care, it just does its thing. So. <laughs> Care, of course, over anthropomorphizing as well. So <clears throat> the other thing, and this is kind of, we've talked about this already in terms of pox virus replication. It was in fact originally discovered in the study of these parvoviruses, the DNA primed DNA replication. It was only later when people were studying these pox viruses that they decided, hey, this is probably likely to be functioning in a very, very similar way. So you have the rep protein, um, and I'm not entirely sure that it's known what the protein is that makes the NIC in pox viruses, but it's definitely this rep protein that you find in parvoviruses, also known as you know, NS proteins. They will <clears throat> bind to this sequence after it's been made double strand. I'll back up a little bit. So when the genome comes inside the cell, it already has a three prime end and a template. So the cellular DNA polymerases can jump onto this and extend the way out through the rest of the genome. So just getting this genome inside the cell, um, and particularly inside the nucleus, and that's where the permissivity thing for these um, parboviruses comes from, um, that then you have a template in a 3 prime OH. So cellular polymerase will make this. Then you need the viral protein to make a nick at this end to provide the 3 prime OH to end up getting you out to the other end of the genome, and that can fold back on itself and provide a template for the next one, round. And one of the ways that this was figured out is if you look at the sequences that are present at the ends of the genome, in this replication process, you end up flipping the complementarity, so the orders of those genes in terms of complement of A, complement of B, complement of C, and it's just by purifying the DNAs and sequencing those DNAs and looking at them that they came up with this model on how it was forming. So that was the AV replication. And then <clears throat> George also talked about some other fascinating single-stranded DNA viruses that are found in plants and then in the environment, which is what we're working on. Uh, the Gemini viruses in particular are very interesting, and not all of them are like this, but many of them, you know, Gemini virus by definition is, has these two capsids that are bound to each other. I should have brought my model of the Gemini viruses with me today. But they've got often have also multiple genomes, and those genomes, again, not unlike you saw with the multiple RNA genomes for some of the RNA viruses that are infecting plants, these are often even in the same virions, as we can, as can tell. You can sometimes see two of them in there. But they have the classic kinds of things that you would need for a single-stranded DNA virus, a rep protein, and a capsid protein, and then some of the proteins that you have to have for plant viruses, the movement proteins, and the other proteins that are used, again, for the, the plant infection process. George also talked briefly about satellites. I wanted to revisit satellites again based on Jared's talk about the virophage. Um, these are extra DNAs, and you also have our satellite RNAs as well, which can get packaged in the same particles that the otherwise, you know, the Gemini virus in this case would be using. And so these are different from the virophage in that they're really taking over pretty much everything that the helper virus, as we call it, is using. So they've got the, you know, borrowing the capsid protein, sometimes borrowing the rep protein as well. And so they use almost all of the extra proteins that you are provided by that first virus infection. Virophage, on the other hand, have pretty much everything that they need encoded in their genomes. They're just taking advantage of the fact that you have all of this replication going on due to the giant virus infection. And in some cases, a few of the proteins, but mostly those are going to be your regulatory proteins, as opposed to here, we really also talk about structural proteins, um, which are involved.
Circular single-stranded DNA virus replication is really fascinating. And I've mentioned this before to some people. Um, when we discovered these cruciviruses in our metagenome sequences, I was really glad that I was teaching this course because I actually then knew something about single-stranded DNA viruses, because otherwise I wouldn't have had any clue what we'd found in our sequences. So if you look at <clears throat> replication of these circular single-stranded DNA viruses, these have a problem because you don't have a nice 3 prime OH that can be used to extend. So what has to happen is you have cellular primase and cellular DNA polymerase that somehow recognizes this small piece of the genome. So we always talk about these as you know, single-stranded DNA viruses, but all of these single-stranded DNA viruses have regions of the genome which are double-stranded. And almost always in these cases, it's a stem loop structure, and it's really this stem here which seems to provide the binding site for cellular primases so they can bind to this structure and provide a double-stranded DNA. So this is a big difference, again, these circular ones relative to the linear ones and the parboviruses. Once you have this double-stranded structure, then the rep protein can basically do its thing. It binds to, makes a nick, provides a 3 prime OH that the cellular polymerase can extend. But here, the big difference is that that strand that was cut, it's now actually covalently attached to the rep protein. So the rep protein cuts and makes a 3 prime end, but that 5 prime end gets hooked up to a tyrosine which is present on the rep protein. So as the cellular polymerase in blue here is replicating its way around the genome, the rep protein is getting that other strand bound to the rep protein. And once it gets all the way to the end of the genome, this rep protein will reverse that cut and ligate the two ends together, giving you a new single-stranded circular genome and this double-stranded genome, which can go around again and again. So we talked about this really briefly with Phi X174, and so it turns out that this process is absolutely identical. This process is extremely similar as well. So the way that these you know, single-stranded DNA viruses replicate is um, by taking the ends, you know, getting a cut, making a nick, again, just like we've seen in the pox viruses and the parvoviruses, uh, but now hooking up that end to your rep protein. So these are the, well, so this is the genome which Jeff Diemer found in Boiling Springs Lake in Lassen Volcanic National Park. And we saw this sequence that was very much like an RNA virus, and it was like, what the heck is an RNA virus doing in this acidic hot lake? Oops, particularly with interesting ghost in the machine. Yeah, it was so bizarre that no one believed it, so the electricity went out. No. <laughs> uh, but what Jeff found was that it was on the same piece of DNA as, probably just this connection here, as a circovirus-like single-stranded DNA virus rep protein. So one of these that makes a nick and then hooks up the 5' prime end to the rep protein, goes its way around, also had a nice stem loop-like structure, which is probably providing the start site for getting that first round of DNA replication. We were the first ones to find this. Um, I forget if, if George mentioned that this paper was rejected the first time that we submitted it and now has over 51,000 accesses on um, Biomed Central and um, got a prize for both Jeff and I as being the best paper that was published in their journal in that year. So tells you about some of the publishing. Oh, why, why did they reject it? Um, the reason they rejected it is the, the embarrassing part, which is we have a genome. We don't have a virus. And at that time, you know, 20, 2011, 2012, um, everybody wanted to see viruses. They didn't want to have sequence analysis, even though it was really bizarre and people had found it in other places. So. No, it was embarrassing on their part because now when we, got the, when we got the prize, the prize was this big deal in Boston right after the um, 
marathon bombing, which was a whole different story. It's kind of surreal. Um, but the editors of Science and Cell were all there and said, oh, you should have submitted it to us. It's like, we tried and you rejected it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that was the embarrassing thing for them. So I just like to try and you know, rub it in their noses whenever I get the chance. So <clears throat> not that I get the chance too terribly often. But, <clears throat> um, but part of why this was uh, so interesting was we weren't the only ones, and it wasn't just in this crazy acidic hot lake that we found these strange recombinant viruses. Um, turns out you find them all over the place, and <clears throat> they have lots and lots of different rep proteins. The capsid protein, curiously enough, is actually very well conserved. And it's, it's hard to see here. If I remember correctly, it's the red one, but it could also be the orange one. Um, the, these are conserved. Um, whereas the rep proteins turn out to be from a whole bunch of different families. And there's way more recombination going on in these genomes than we had ever realized. You know, just RNA-DNA recombination, the grand theft RNA. How many of you went and checked out the grand theft RNA paper? Um, again, still my favorite title. <clears throat> but they're recombining inside each of the rep proteins as well. So this is going to be a really tough puzzle to figure out um, exactly how these things are recombining with each other and how they arose in the first place. But just the whole basic idea that you can have recombination between DNA and RNA is really bizarre. Uh, but it's there, again, like the permissives and sensitives. <laughs> they're there, and so we're trying to figure out what's going on with them. So lots and lots of different ones. Stay tuned. Um, there should be a paper coming out. In the not too distant future, I keep beating on <coughs> George and Nacho to make sure they get me a manuscript here as far as that's concerned. So I'm oh, sorry, questions on that before we talk about my, my other near and dear uh, viruses here. Archaeal virions, um, they're very different from other virions that people discovered, although when I get on a not too infrequent basis people who will send me um, other scientists, electron micrographs, and say, hey, does this look like a virus? Is this bizarre structure? Um, we didn't think it looked like anything like this, but it might look like this or kind of like this. So do you think it's a virion? And usually I say it's probably junk. Um, so uh, one of the favorite quotes I had from my postdoctoral advisor is, einmal is keinmal, once is never. So if you see something bizarre in an electron micrograph, you've got to see it a lot, and it's got to be really similar to actually be able to say that it really looks like a virion. So that was, uh, but these are the kinds of things that people have seen. You do see a lot of these bottle-shaped viruses. You see a lot of these lemon-shaped ones. You see a lot of these long filamentous ones, um, et cetera. So we mo mostly work with Fusella viruses. Um, again, those of you in the mutant viruses from Hell Lab, a few of you here know lots about this. And you came to the great presentations the last couple of days. You heard even more about them. So these are lemon-shaped or spindle-shaped virions with short tails at one end. They have double-stranded, circular, positively supercoiled DNA genomes. They integrate specifically into the host. Um, and this is rather similar to lambda. They can be induced by UV radiation, also very similar to lambda. And you find them pretty much throughout the world, wherever you find high temperature, low pH environments, 70 degrees Celsius plus, and pH of 3 and below. Um, to summarize, lots of work by mostly me and my lab, but some other labs as well. Uh, they're only partially conserved, so you find these viruses throughout the world in various different hot spring environments, but only about half of the genes are found in all of them. The other half are not, which is really strange. That's not what you would see in most of the other virus families that we've talked about so far. In fact, each of these different viruses would probably end up being in a different virus family, the way that most classifications are done. Um, only about half the genes are essential, which makes sense from the conservation purposes. And it turns out that some of the genes, when you knock them out, you make really funny-looking particles. And these are some of those funny-looking particles that you can see here. Instead of being nice lemons, they're more sort of cigar shapes and elongated. We think we know something about how the structure of SSV is put together. It's clearly not icosahedrally symmetric. It's clearly not helically symmetric. But it might, emphasis on might here, um, have a structure that in its very basis could be similar to 
the HIV-1 capsid. So here you've got the couple of pentamers. Again, you always have to have 12 pentamers to make a closed structure if you've got pentamers and hexamers, but they don't always have to be icosahedrally symmetric relative to each other. So in the case of the HIV capsid, you've got a one end of a fullerene cone here, another end of the fullerene cone here, and the middle is very different. We think that we might have something similar here with a t equals three like end at one end, a t equals three like end at the other end, and then very different in between. And this may be where that VP3 protein is because if you get rid of it, you end up with this elongated structure. Again, lots of hand waving here, but at least it's a potential model for how these spindle-shaped viruses could come together. But clearly, it's not the only way that you can have spindle-shaped viruses. This one is the Acidionis two-tailed virus, um, worked on by David Prangishvili, who I showed right at the end of the archaeal virus talk. These start out looking a lot like SSVs, but then outside the cell, they undergo maturation, where they grow these tails at either end. So the maturation we also talked about for HIV, that's the proteolytic maturation that happens after you have the particle released from the cell. There's proteolysis, and that will actually form the capsids that have these fullerene cone structures to them. But this is even more massive change in terms of the virion structure. But extracellular maturation um, is something that also happens um, in HIV. Also in archaeal viruses, we have some nice examples of A-form DNA, which is being packaged. The first example of A-form DNA that I know of that's packaged in a viral genome. The positively supercoiled DNA that you see in SSV virions was also the first example of any of these kinds of DNAs as well. Another example of firsts that you've seen or you have seen other people have seen, they publish it and so we can see them, um, is if you look at some of the lipids that are involved in some of the enveloped viruses that infect archaea, it looks as if, and this is through computational modeling, they don't actually have a structure of this, is that a lipid which is normally a tetraether lipid, so it's got a head group at this end and a head group at this end, and contiguous bonds, the carbon-carbon bonds that will go from one side to the other, the only way that you can fit a lipid into this structure is by folding it in half. And you know, folding lipids in half is just a really bizarre thing. But it's the best way to interpret the data that we have so far. Mentioned the fullerene cone model for how we think SSVs fit together. There's another group um, at Montana State University, great friends of mine, really good scientists. They have another model, which you know, one of our models may be correct. We could both be wrong. Uh, they're looking at another spindle-shaped virus. This is the Acidionis <coughs> tailed spindle-shaped virus, horrible name. Um, but they have a structure for the capsid protein, which are these two alpha helices. <coughs> and they model them as being wrapped around each other. Kind of think of this, you know, kind of like a sweater that's, you know, being knitted around the outside of your virion. But multiple strands of these alpha helices that they think wrap together and could also form a spindle-shaped structure. So this is just a different model on how we think you could be making spindle-shaped structures. Could be fullerene cones, could be something like this, could be something completely different. We don't know. The last thing that we mentioned as far as the archaeal viruses being bizarre and different are these new release structures, the virus-associated pyramids, which form due to the expression of one viral protein. And then after you have the formation of these viral pyramids, they open up and make a hole in the cell surface, and the virions are then released through them. This happens for both SIRV, so Sulfolobus londicus rod-shaped virus, that's the one that also packages the A-form DNA, and STIV, which is the beautiful icosahedral one with the projections of the five-fold axis that I found in, in Yellowstone National Park. Questions on archaeal viruses? Okay, now retroviruses. 
now for something completely different. <laughs> These <clears throat> are, of course, the viruses, classic retroviruses, package RNA and virions, but integrate double-stranded DNA into the host genome, and then that gets transcribed, made into virions, and goes back out. Originally found as RNA tumor viruses, and the big surprise there was, you know, how the heck do you have a tumor virus that is <clears throat> RNA because DNA is our genetic material. But these all have this very similar structure. They've got a repeat sequence at either end of the genome, which as we'll see is critical for replication. Unique sequences at the five prime end, unique sequences at the three prime end, primer binding sites, splice sites, and then these polyproteins, which are made on the inside of these genomes. The GAG, the group-specific antigens, matrix nucleocapsid capsid, polymerase, protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase, all made as polyproteins, mostly just the GAG, sometimes with a frame shift that's supposed to be shown as an overlap here, giving you a not much longer polyprotein. And then the envelope proteins, the surface and transmembrane proteins, which are made through alternative splicing through this five prime splice site and three prime splice site. This is the overview of the replication cycle. You have binding to a receptor at the plasma membrane. This binding leads to fusion of the envelope, release of the capsid. That capsid has the reverse transcriptase in it. Again, like what we're seeing with pox viruses, you have this <coughs> capsid with enzymes in it. That reverse transcriptase is active in the capsid, will give you a double-stranded DNA, We'll see in just a second that double-stranded DNA has to get inside the nucleus in the lentiviruses like HIV. This is actively transported. Most of the other retroviruses actually have to wait for the nuclear membrane to break down because this is a really big structure, double-stranded DNA with all the proteins associated with it. Once it gets into the nucleus or close to the DNA, it will randomly integrate, randomly probably because these are active, non-compacted parts of the genome. Once it's inserted in the genome, you have cellular RNA polymerase that will make the RNA. That will get exported. The RNA will get exported. Most of the time, it'll be making GAG. Some cases, you'll have translational frame shifting and make GAG and Paul. All of these guys get sent off to the nuclear membrane, or sorry, no, sorry, the plasma membrane to get assembled. At the same time, you have splicing that takes place. Splicing then leads to your envelope proteins, which are going to be surface protein and transmembrane proteins. These are sticking into the membrane, again, through transmembrane proteins. These get sent to the plasma membrane as well. You have viral genomes that are exported. All of this comes together. You still have polyproteins in this case. So this is, these are polyproteins that are in the virion, as that virion is getting released from the cell, then the protease is active in the virion to chop apart the different parts of the matrix, the nucleocapsid protein, the capsid protein. And so if you looked at that video that I highly recommended, the animation, you can see that protease process um, pulling apart the polyprotein and allowing it to assemble into these capsids, and that's why the protease is always present in virions when they get inside the cell in the first place. Replication of these genomes is convoluted, I would say, um, where we have a cellular tRNA. That's what provides the primer for the reverse transcriptase, which will use the RNA as a template because reverse transcriptase, of course, is a RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That will give you a DNA piece at this end, which is complementary to the other end of either the same RNA, but there are two RNAs that are always packaged in each retroviral genome. So this could also be the other one of those RNAs that it binds to. And this recombination, you know, going back and forth between the two genomes, is partly why you end up with very high mutation rates in these quasi-species, which form, as well as the fact that the reverse transcriptase is relatively low fidelity. So once you've undergone this recombination, now you can extend out through the rest of the genome, and that gives you the U3R and U5 all together in one part of the genome. Then this RNA gets degraded by the 
RNase H, which is part of the reverse transcriptase, eventually provides you with a short polypurine tract that serves as a primer for your second strand. That then goes out to the tRNA, which can't be replicated because there's a modification in that tRNA. It's a dihydrouridine where it can't be replicated anymore. So that gives you the primer binding site hanging out at this end, which can recombine yet again over here. Could be the same molecule, could be the opposite molecule. And now you end up with your integrative form with the long terminal repeat, U3RU5, at both ends of the genome. This gets poked into the host genome. This is what happens for all retroviruses. HIV is a little bit more complicated than this, but the ba same basic structure is there, GAG, Paul, and ENV. You just have extra proteins in HIV. TAT and REV are the only extra two that we talked about. Particularly the TAT protein is involved in transcription and really serves as an anti-terminator for transcription, so transactivator of transcription. That protein, once it's made, will allow the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, normally, again, the cellular RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, to actually transcribe the whole proviral genome as opposed to just a little short piece. So you have to have this TAT protein in order to get whole genome replication. And the REV protein, I think I did a really crummy job of explaining the first time around, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this. So <clears throat> the REV protein, again, is one of these that's alternatively spliced out of the RNA, which is again made by cellular RNA de DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, this then, through splicing, forms this, this REV protein. Now, the REV protein binds to a sequence called the REV response element in the viral RNA, which is actually present in the envelope gene. So binding to the envelope gene, but this envelope gene, this has already been spliced, right? Because you have the splicing that normally takes place here. So this guy can get transported in and out of the nucleus all the time. But the important thing is that you also have to have full length genome and unspliced RNA, which gets taken out of the nucleus. So it turns out that this RRE is only part of the process. So you have to have the RRE and another element, which is actually over here in the genome. Both of those have to be on the same RNA, and you have to have the REV protein in order to get your full-length RNA transported out of the nucleus, and then eventually to the cytoplasmic membrane, and then being packaged. So that's the, the REV protein. It's not just cycling the you know, all of the RNAs in and out of the nucleus, it's together with this cis-acting element, which is over here, which allows the full-length genome to get out of the nucleus. Because again, normally, unspliced RNA, there are lots of signals that we talked about in molecular biology that mean that unspliced RNA gets stuck in the nucleus. So you have to have this active system for getting it back out. There's <clears throat> now very good HIV therapy blocking all different kinds of parts of replication. So integrase inhibitors, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. This is the Truvada, the PARP, you know, pre-exposure prophylaxis, but protease inhibitors and binding inhibitors. All four of these are used in most of these antiviral therapies. Very end, last lecture that I gave, at least the whole complete one, was about the NCLDVs, again, these things that roll off the tongue. Um, we spent quite a while talking about pox viruses already, so this is very similar to what's happening with these giant viruses, particularly the Mimi viruses and the FICO DNA viruses. They are, are all clearly related to each other, but very distantly related to each other. And part of that is if you look at the PBCV1 genome, Paramecium brucella chlorella virus, they have hairpin ends probably replicating extremely similar to the way that the pox viruses are. But the big surprises in these giant viruses, not just the size of the virions, but also the things that are encoded in their genome. Lots of tRNAs, ubiquitin, et cetera. And as we'll see, you know, more and more of the translational machinery, depending on which genome we happen to be looking at. Um, PBCV1 is probably actually the best understood of these, with possible exception of Mimi virus. Um, PBCV1, even though it is one of these giant viruses, it's infecting eukaryotes, 
actually acts very similar to a bacteriophage. It has a spike, like a tail, at one end, makes a hole in the host membrane, and then you have release of the genome, and that goes through and eventually ends up lysing the cell. So, at least in terms of entry, the PBCV1 is extremely similar to bacteriophage. Then we talked a little bit about the Mimi viruses, the really big viruses, um, Acanthamoeba polyphaga, so the vast majority of these giant viruses have been found because people have tried to find those that are infecting amoeba. There are almost definitely, and this is something also that Jared talked about, almost definitely some other ones that are infecting other things, but generally infecting amoeba, and they're ginormous, just pretending to be bacteria. They have these unique stargate-like structures um, releasing the genome once you have, in fact, it's really the membrane, which is going to then fuse with the amoeba membrane. Then a few more giant viruses, the Pandora virus, whose genome is larger than almost all our kale genomes, bigger even than some eukaryotic genomes. Again, lots of translation proteins, but still no ribosomal subunits. Some more genomes that people have found now in metagenome sequence, so environmental sequences. These have almost all of the amino acyl tRNA synthetases and lots of different tRNAs. The largest, actually, virion that's been found to date is these Tupon viruses, just because they have these massively long tails. So the pythopithovirus is actually slightly bigger than this. Um, but in terms of the head and tail, um, these are you know, <laughs> almost one and a half microns in length. Also, again, lots of tRNAs, all of the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, most of the translation steps, so there's not much left to actually um, get between cellular and viral. Briefly, Jared talked about these virophages, um, and I talked about the satellite virus a little bit earlier on that are really stealing lots of structural and replicative proteins from the other virus. Here, they basically just seem to be taking advantage of these viral factories. And so the infecting of other viruses, this goes all the way back to lecture one, eek, um, when we talked about, you know, what's a virus? It's not just the virion. So the virus is that whole replicative cycle. And so particularly if you think about viral factories, the viral factory, that's what's getting infected by these virophages. These virophages, as Jared pointed out, are potentially closely related to transposons, particularly DNA transposons that you find in lots of genomes. And it's almost like a DNA transposon has somehow picked up a capsid protein and then become a virus. So origins of viruses, where do these things come from in the first place? Um, we may be actually getting some insight in terms of the study of some of these um, virions. Really briefly, um, I talked about the flu virus vaccines, um, the one that I really like, which is the flu mist that hopefully we'll see again at some point, um, which is the recombination now of a cold adapted strain. Importantly here, really wanted to mention that a lot of this is about the polymerases. So, the polymerases seem to be very important for the high pathogenicity, vi pathogenicity viruses, the 1918 and bird flu, but also for some of these lower ones. And what are we doing to try and solve having to get a flu shot every year? Trying to find stem-specific antibodies. And I'm halfway through listening to that twiv about the um, stem-specific antibodies. So <sighs> that's it. Thanks for a good term. Um, please fill out your evaluations. Um, one of the things, if you have some time, um, say what you liked about, you know, the thrown virions in terms of answering questions. That worked well, it didn't work well. Um, you can let me know or you can just write them down in your evaluations. Um, exam on Tuesday. Questions, ask the proctor. Those will be emailed to me. Um, I will try and have grades on Thursday of that week and hope to see at least some of you at commencement and a few later this afternoon as well.